immensely interesting and a lot of interest in tonight's presentation from Michael Manette, Richard Manette and Nick Day, who are gonna tell us about their journey not too long ago across the Atlantic uh, on the ARC 2023. And so they're gonna give a bit of an intro to themselves, but they're expert sailors and credentialed and, and all the rest. So uh, let's welcome uh, Richard, Michael and Nick Day. If we have the mic going, I think we're set. Excellent. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, wonderful to see the crowd that is out. And I was mentioning uh, just recently that when we were going to do this talk back in January, this was like a fresh memory. And now it's almost a retrospective. I will also mention, however, that if you are interested, and by the way, I'll be kind of animating this presentation tonight. We have lots of information, so feel free to take it all in. Uh, there's a little bit of video. You'll get a feel for what it's like to be on the ocean as well. So I'll animate that uh, as we run through the session tonight, and then we'll have time for questions. And by the way, just before we get started, so uh, Richard Monette is right here, my son, uh, was one of the crew, and Nick Day is up in the front here as well. I'll run through most of the front part of the presentation. When we do Q&A, by all means, we'll all be here to answer questions for you at that point. All right. Now, in terms of the date as to when this took place, this ran from November 19th to December 7th. The ARC, which is the uh, Atlantic Rally for Cruisers, some times in the past it used to be considered a race. Uh, I think the reason for that is it is timed. There are categories of boats. They have a racing category, in fact, and some amazing, beautiful boats. Uh, Multi-hull boats. Uh, we were in the single-hull class, cruising class, and we could get into those kinds of details. My intention in this presentation will take about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, so get comfortable. Uh, I think most people have had something to uh, nosh on and have a drink, so enjoy as we go through is that you'll get a sense of what it is really like to be at sea. Now, in terms of introduction, just to get started, this is our boat, uh, so Brandy B, normally down in uh, berth B40, uh, C&C 27. We've been sailing on the river here for about six years, seven years. Uh, I'm actually originally from Crystal Beach, and long before this facility existed, I used to drag a little sunflower down as a young teenager across the rocks. Highway 17 was a single road uh, highway. And as the ice was coming off the river, I would go and do some sailing and windsurfing. So I've had a long uh, kind of lifetime. And I know some of the folks here and some friends have had a similar journey. We then moved into more recently the cruising category. Now I will say right at the outset, and I do appreciate the comment about being credentialed, uh, and you know, we did go to Advantage Boating and get our cruising certificate so we could actually uh, captain Brandy B properly, and I certainly recommend that for anyone to take that training. Uh, but I wouldn't say we're expert sailors by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I have a sense that probably everybody here who has a, a good feel for sailing could absolutely do this trip. Uh, so it was just kind of a lot of fun. Now, the arc plays to a broad range. There's a few words there. I'll let you just kind of uh, read through that because it describes what the starting and end point are of the trip. Twenty seven hundred nautical miles. Uh, it's a pretty long trip. And effectively what this does and we'll have a look at it. We're going from Las Palmas, so the Canary Islands and ending up in St. Lucia. So that's what the trip is about. So how does one do a trip like this? Well, the first thing obviously is the boat. And a little while back, uh, my son and I, and with Nick sailing with us out on the river, we got to thinking what is our next adventure? Uh, just innocent discussion about how to do that. And it then led to more of a serious discussion and we started to say, well, how would we go across? And there's a few things that you'll want to be asking yourself, but in terms of the categories of boats, our boat's a little small, you know, as you know, when you've read wonderful uh, and even Canadian uh, crossings of fairly small boats making it across the ocean. But we're looking at something a bit bigger, uh, more seaworthy. There's a few categories, typically 50, 60, 70 foot type boats for the boats that will make these crossings. And we figured we would go with a company. 
Uh, many of the folks are like families, they'll go with their own private boats, they'll bring some crew to make the crossing. And in our case, we didn't have a boat. We could have gone possibly with, and down in the, kind of the inset are some very fancy boats, like oysters, beautiful, wonderful cabins, that sort of thing. We were thinking, what is important to us in doing this? And there are a couple of criteria. Number one was safety. So we're looking for any kind of boat that was rigid, had sea legs to it, uh, reliability, a track record. And we're also interested in speed. <laughs> so we were, like most of us, out on the river. You know, you get two boats, you're trying to you know, trim the sails and see who can get down the river or up river a little faster. So we wanted to be towards the front of the pack. And you can wait and see how we did as we go through the presentation. We ended up going, and we're wearing the shirts, by the way. Uh, Rubicon 3 is actually a sail and training. And you can see the logo on the side of the boat about this idea of sail, train, and really it's an experience of crossing and learning. And you can see the crew there. There were 12 of us on the boat. Hands-on is really the key word. We wanted to be on a boat that we had to sail. If we're going to do this, and there's wonderful, and I know some folks have had beautiful cruises across the ocean, that is a wonderful experience, and you see you know, the, the glamour of crossing the ocean. In our case, we're looking to be on a boat where it's really hands-on. Uh, so if you're interested in a hands-on experience, you will pick up a lot from this presentation in spades. So from that, the little caveat, and by the way, you'll see these. I've just got little tips. So talking to Richard and Nick, we said, you know, what are your little things would you want to know about? So there's a tip here is hands-on also means like this is hands-on. I actually had a bit of a shoulder inju injury at the start of it. So stretching and making sure that you're ready for this is just something to think about. If you want to do hands-on, just make sure that you're in good shape. So just, I'll throw those tips in as we go across. All right, the boat. So there is the boat in the center that we were on. And Blue Jay, in comparison to our CNC 27, so there's our boat in front. And this is kind of roughly scaled. So you kind of see the height. Not a huge boat, uh, but much larger. And you notice that Blue Jay just passed our boat quite easily. We would have a cruising speed of, I don't know, five, six knots. We have a really strong wind. Maybe we got a little over seven knots. With Blue Jay, as we go through the presentation, we were hitting nine knots quite regularly, and that's about speed. So the longer the boat, there is a formula, there's some engineering and dynamics to it, and the longer boats have a higher speed. So that's one of the benefits of going on a slightly larger boat. The other element then is, and people would ask, okay, how do you get ready? So the preparation for it. This was on the floor uh, at the house beforehand. And as you have a gander at it, you know, sleeping bag, uh, some sun protection clothing, uh, that all went into a duffel. So I had to have a soft duffel that we could bring onto the boat and then store away. And you notice at the front, the gravel. And uh, you notice I do wear glasses and I bought a whole box of just disposable, you know, these $5 glasses, which by the way, work fine. And I'll talk about those things a little bit. You'll also notice that little blue uh, sunglasses, Polaroid lenses for the sun is so important. So being ready to deal with the sun is certainly one of the things to think about. So when you're looking at this, there, are, there is that idea of a daily kit. And as we go through, you can kind of watch for the behavior on the boat as well. And a little packing, like I know Nick was expert at this, little packing cube so you could have everything in a certain area to get at. Uh, absolutely fabulous idea. Uh, and anything to do with the sun. So there's a couple more tips as we go. So let's get into the trip a little bit. So you're gonna see a blend here as we go through the presentation of maps and kind of informative items. And then I'll show you actual pictures from the trip as well. When we arrived, you know, that's the beach on the left side, uh, the ARC office, this is a big deal. Uh, so there's an office set up, they run this every year and it's run out of the Grand Canary location. And when one gets there in terms of discovering um, how to communicate. Just a little tip, I don't know if air, although I'm not advertising for them exactly, but getting something so that you have your data available. So just have a look at those things. Uh, also your hotel, when you get there, there's an option to go on the boat and maybe if people ask questions about how comfortable is the boat, um, probably Rick, Nick and I will tell you how at every opportunity we would try to find a hotel room. <laughs> 
because it was certainly a little more comfortable in a hotel room than on the boat. And all that being with 12 other people on a boat entails in close quarters. You can think of uh, the wonderful sounds that emanate from that. So the boats, there's Blue Jay. So this was when we first saw Blue Jay, we got off the plane, we're driving up and we see Blue Jay. There is a sister boat, by the way, which is part of the story called Hummingbird. So Rubicon have four boats in total, two of them were in the ark this year. And at this point, you can decide who's the good guys and who's the bad guys. Uh, but Blue Jay, uh, we basically were saying we're gonna be the first ones to make it across. There is also a tracking tool, a yellow brick tracker, which is what that top view is. And I know a few of you actually were aware of it, and thanks so much for kind of watching. You probably knew where we were more than we knew where we were across in the ocean at times. Uh, but you can see where Blue Jay was parked along the side. And really, the, what's impressive is all the boats. So there's a lot of boats uh, that are lined up to do this every year. Sleeping quarters. So this is the pretty picture at the beginning of the trip. So we put our duffels. Now, as it turns out, we were at the boat almost the first ones, and we thought, oh, we'll put our bags there later. When we went back to the boat, all of the bunks were taken. So we only were given the bunks that were available. If you can pick your bunk ahead of time, they all have different headroom and so forth. Not that anyone was tremendously better than the other, but this is what it looked like when it was nice and clean. And as it turned out, uh, so I had a lower bunk on the, lot, on the right side of the picture, sorry, left side of the picture. And then Richard was on the top with that red bag and Nick was on the top with the other. They're kind of opposite each other. And um, do you want to be in the front of the boat? You know, is there more movement? Would you rather be at the back of the boat? Maybe it's a little more stable. Do you want to be on, okay, we're going to be sailing this way. Maybe I want to be on the port side or the starboard side. Uh, those are things you can play with. I don't know that any of that made a big difference, quite frankly, but we were more or less midships, just uh, around where the uh, foremast was. Now, in terms of the things that you want to pack, and I won't go into a huge amount of detail, there's a checklist at the end of this presentation, and by all means, if you have questions, uh, we'll leave time for questions when we get to the end of this. But to have a look at the sorts of things, but it's warm. It was warm weather, so shorts, a shirt, and this is the shirt, we're all wearing our Rubicon t-shirt. We had a couple other t-shirts, uh, mostly things that would block the sun. I had a hat, you'll see that as well. But just really being prepared. <laughs> and as we learned, we spent so much time wondering about footwear. And you know, should I have my sailing shoes or boots or this sort of thing? I'm not sure if there's pictures of the first mate where you can see his feet, flip flongs. He just wore flip flops. He's been across the ocean a few times. So, you know, there you go. It can actually be pretty casual in terms of the crossing. All right, some other tips which are really important is uh, that's the group, and we're now just, we went out for dinner. And I highly recommend this, is to meet the crew before you go. And if you look at the faces a little bit closely, I would suggest everybody's a little pensive. You know, we're on our first beer. Uh, you can see everybody looking, another person has just uh, come to take a picture of us as well. And the names are down the side, and you know, we can talk about these characters, mostly from England, a uh, fellow from Sweden. You know, we're Canadians, Nick's kind of from New Zealand background. So that was kind of the nationality, but mostly UK. It took a little bit, and I have British uh, origin in my family. It took a bit to tune our ears to the British uh, English and the humor, uh, which was kind of interesting. But what happened over a couple of years was, and I must say, this was the Blue Jay crew. Turned out the captain of Hummingbird decided to have their team meet up. And as a result of that, they were supposed to be there also, but they did not come to the dinner, which is where a pact was formed, where Blue Jay was going to absolutely be the first of the two boats. <laughs> so. It was good, there was kind of this common bonding thing. And as we'll kind of describe as we go across, how do 12 people get along crossing the ocean? Two thirds of the way across, a few folks said, you know, it was really smart that we got together at the beginning to get to know each other a little bit. Okay, here's the bunks laid out. So we now go back to the boat. Uh, there was a couple of days of practice and training and we could sleep on the boat now for those days. So just, you know, and again, all pretty neat and tidy. Uh, in terms of the bunks and how it's set up. Other little things that we learned about is, and uh, my wife Ruth, for example, had put in some little bags of cheesies. 
which I discovered in my bag. Well, I kind of knew they were there when we left, but oh my gosh, along the way, just to have a little treat of something, not that the boat food was bad, but just having little treats, little things that just make life a little more interesting on those days when you think, will we ever cross this vast ocean, uh, was a good little tip. And then other things in terms of uh, just kind of treat your comfort things is a good thing to think about. All right, let's get into the nitty gritty. We have sailors here, you're wondering, okay, how do we do this? Uh, the training, long list of things down the left side. Uh, if you have a look at it, probably what you would expect. Safety items, uh, dealing with uh, navigation, uh, how do we steer the boat, sleeping, um, how does the team work together? <laughs> So you see team bonding and bar, okay, figures. Uh, sharpeners, we learned that was a British word for going out for a drink before you go out for drinks. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you, we had a great trip. Uh, and the boat is dry. I should mention that right off the bat. So the boat is dry, but before going was an opportunity to spend a bit of time. But passport, communications, um, WhatsApp turned out to be a really good way to communicate amongst each other as well. So those are some things that we kind of picked up on. The other item, of course, if you have any special food needs, it was wonderful. Our skipper turned out uh, she was vegetarian and a couple others were, I tend to, you know, without getting too much into diet, share those items ahead of time uh, so that the boat can be stocked properly with the food that you'd like to have on the boat. Worked out really well. And the other thing, and I'll show you a couple of pictures of this, is there's perishables and then there's foods that will last longer. And even as we crossed the ocean, uh, Nick turned out to be a professional chef, who knew? So we actually ate quite well as we went across. And everybody cooked, so we, we did quite well. But people were digging through cupboards that we didn't know existed on the boat and pulling things out as we went across the boat. Those were the non-perishables, mostly. We found a few things that we had to throw out. But uh, food is a big part of it. So here's training, uh, just kind of a typical view. Uh, there's a picture of Richard actually with the emergency steering, which is really heavy. You can kind of see a grimace. Like that Richard, you're like, oh my God, this thing is so heavy. Um, but practicing drills, what goes wrong, learning about how the boat works, that sort of thing was really important. And again, um, all those elements of lifting things, grinding, you know, bringing the sheets in, halyards up, that sort of thing. So practicing everything to get comfortable with the boat over a couple of days is what was going on, uh, practicing our knots. And you can see here, this is Anders, as it turns out, doing the man overboard. So it's pretty good freeboard on this boat. There's no way you could ever reach in and get someone. And if you're in the ocean and it's pitching. So we actually did go out to sea in the waves and practice going out with uh, one of the lions. You take, anyway, without going into details, we can answer questions uh, later if you want. Uh, but basically running a line, getting the one person down, kind of rappelling down with another line to latch onto the person. There's a whole procedure about how to do this to get somebody uh, back into the boat if it's off the boat. I will mention right here that there are a couple of rules that were just sacrosanct. And if I asked my crewmates, they'd say, what is the number one rule about when you're on the boat? Don't go off the boat. Don't go off the boat, right? <laughs> and the second rule is don't go off the boat. Um, as we learned, there's been a few incidents um, crossing the ocean, so it's not absolutely 100% safe. But we knew we would clip in, certainly at nighttime, inclement weather. Everybody had vests, and we'd clip in as we went across. So definitely don't fall off the boat. But we did learn the drills in terms of being recovered. And uh, I'll say it's possible to be recovered, but you don't want to fall off the boat. OK, food. We're going to be at ocean for a while now. You don't want any bugs or parasites. So all the fruit had to be washed. It was laid out and dried. And you can just see the kinds of stocks that are being brought in. So these are all the stores being brought in, being washed. And different crew members had different jobs to do different things at the time. So that gives you a bit of a sense of some of the, those types of foods. The other wonderful thing about the Ark, which I'll mention, is that there is wonderful training available. Uh, this was actually a session. This fellow has been across the ocean, and it was an incredible number. I think it was like 80 times or something. Some crazy number uh, have sailed around, but did a whole talk about what we would see in the skies in terms of the stars. 
So the ARC, I would say from that perspective, is really great because they will do a lot of training and education and really interesting things you can learn and obviously interest you can see by the audience uh, that were involved in those different activities. And then just that little inset, this now is the night before, so just down on the bottom left, is we just had a little team dinner. Uh, now we had the team dinner with the Hummingbird crew as well. We were all together and happy, even though Hummingbird didn't know we were absolutely gonna beat them across the ocean at this point. All right. So in terms of the schedule, you might wonder what's life like on the boat? So as we're now getting a range, you can see a list. There were three teams. And if you think of 24 hours, this boat required manual helming the whole time. Well, not a stick, but a wheel. But it had no auto tiller, wind vane, or anything like that. This was a true sail this boat across the ocean. So there are three teams set up. We were one team. Team C, which happened to work for Canada, was kind of nice. Uh, team A was uh, a group of four, which had uh, the UK folks plus uh, one of the folks from Sweden, as it turned out, and then Team B, another group. Team B kind of knew each other beforehand. Team C, we knew each other. It was nice to have friends, and, uh, and then very quickly we got to know each other, but we worked in teams, and the idea was three hours on, and then another team goes, another team goes. So that's six hours before you have to come back again. And depending on what one shift was, if you're off watch, and you did not have assigned duties, there was a duty board as well, then you could actually get up to six hours of sleeping time. If you had some other activities, which might be doing some uh, checking the boat, could be related to cooking or cleaning up dishes or that sort of thing, you'd have other duties related to that. So those were some of the other activities. So that's how it was set up. And if you think about that, the way this works is nine hours, nine hours, 18. If I do another nine, I'm 27. That's not exactly 24 hours, is it? So we're off kilter by three hours. So what would happen, which is really cool, is we were going forward three hours every time we shift changed. So supposing we did the six to nine at night shift, the next night or time we came around, we do the nine to 12 or midnight. Then we did the midnight to three, and then we did kind of the graveyard shift, three to six a.m. So we actually experienced what it was like to be on the boat all the time. And some very interesting observations one takes when doing that about, I know in the Ottawa River, I'm always looking and checking for deadheads or things. <laughs> We're sailing across the ocean, like nine, 10 knots, wind blowing. And I had no idea what was right in front of the boat. Like, there's radar, you know, there's ships. We know where ships were, of course, but otherwise. So there's that general sense, and one becomes quite comfortable with it, actually. Uh, you're, you're keeping an eye, there's three of us. One is watching, you know, if there's anything really obvious, we'd probably spot it, but when it's nighttime and the moon is not out, uh, there's a fair amount of just believing in nature, and it's really a, kind of a profound experience from that perspective, from a trust. Okay, I'm sure you're interested in what's it like to do this trip. So here we are. It is now Sunday, November 19th, official day to start. We're all lined up in our shirts and everything, ready to go. Uh, by the way, this little picture here, just see that pennant, the bungee? Bergy, sorry? It's right here. So that's the bergy that went across the ocean. Uh, so very pleased and take pictures of it. You know, it can be part of NSC uh, folklore, I don't know. And it's signed by the crew as well. So we flew our little flag all the way across, which was great and it stood the test. It's a big thing. If you look up on the dock there, we're now puttering out. Uh, everybody's just under motor uh, leaving. That's our skipper, by the way, Holly. Uh, she's been across a few times, just a wonderful skipper uh, from that perspective. Youthful, you know, Richard, Nick, quite youthful. The first mate is just on the left. So we had kind of a youthful group on the boat. Uh, There's one or two folks who are closer to my age and then the other folks are probably all more my age. Uh, some retired, some about to retire was what made up the crew. But here we are, we're on our way out. All right. All right, we'll get a bit better at this as we go. I can turn this up more so it'll be a bit better next time. All right, well, let's carry on. Sorry about that. Oh, there we go. <laughs> it's 
what you'll notice, look at all the boats. Like this is just like a huge flotilla heading out for the start of the, the event. Now, while we were heading out, down below, one of the crew members was getting lunch ready because life goes on. Like once the, the timer starts, life goes on. Everything has to happen, even when you're sailing. So there's the boats that are being lined up on the right side. And then I'll just talk uh, for a moment about the rigging on the boat. And I'll just let this play in the background a bit. You'll hear some of the instructions being given as we're getting ready to uh, prepare the boat to cross the start line. So we're getting pretty close. So that's the command. There's a, a military ship. There's another boat as well. Now, the boat itself had what's called a Yankee, which had a fairly sharp angle at the front. And the idea was if the boat was heeling over in big waves in the ocean, it wouldn't catch. I know out in the river here, we'll run some of our foresails that have a lower cut. So we had the Yankee that was out in the front. It did have a stay sail, so there's a second stay sail, and then, of course, the main sail. Uh, various sizes were available for us, and of course, we could do the reefing on that. Because of the stay sail, so if you picture your foresail, you have another stay sail, which goes about eh, maybe 80% up the main mast, and it has a line back from that portion that can be brought on. So when you bring up the stay sail, it allows you to tension the mast again. So we're running back, uh, which is a little different you know, than the boats that we see out on the river here. So that was kind of nice. And for crossing, we had to have the motor off. So this was just getting everything ready. Uh, we're on the right tack at this point. And then in terms of the start, and I'll let you just listen to this. You'll hear the gun go off, and this is the start of the race. So that's the beginning of the race. So it's certainly a lot of anticipation and excitement, and you can just see all the boats there. I know a lot of people have asked, oh, can you see boats across the ocean? Well, I'll show you what you can see soon uh, once we get going a bit. After the first number of hours, we're now crossing the bottom of the Canary Islands. Because the way the trade winds were blowing this year, they were quite low. And what ended up happening is rather than going straight across, we ended up going south quite a bit down the coast of Africa before we then cut across. So we went down, heading back towards Africa at this point, around the eastern edge of Cape Verde, and immediately you start to see these beautiful sights. There's Richard at the helm on this particular shift, and uh, you can see the sun going down. You can see uh, maybe three, four boats, something like that. So already, you can't actually see many boats. They start to spread out pretty quick. So that's the beginning, and the next thing that happens real soon is sleeping, figuring those different activities out. One of the nice things that happened that we discovered about sleeping, because of the watches, even though during training we had 12 people all at the same time, because we go and sail and then sleep on the boat, and it was a bit of a cacophony. We learned to wear, you know, put something in your ears for snoring and that sort of thing, and I have to say I'm guilty of that. Uh, not the only one. And because of the shift changes, it turned out that when Richard, Nick and I went down off of our shift, the other group left. And three of them were in the forecastle, which kind of the front end boat was like a little cabin. So that was one team, and we didn't even hear them so much. So actually the cabin was empty, and for the most part we then slept much, much better once people were moving about. So that was uh, really quite pleasant from that perspective. So life on the boat. Uh, so evening dinner, uh, getting ready for the watch, a couple of pictures. You can start to see the galley in the left side. And this is where we discovered Nick is this professional cook from previous years. Richard's helping out. Uh, it's hot. Oh my gosh. So 
Often we had to have our shirts off just for preservation, even though up on deck we're wearing uh, a little bit more. And you can see the, uh, the various types of safety equipment that we're wearing. You'll pick up on that as we go across. You can see the first mate. So up on deck, when we were on watch, there was always one or the other. The skipper was somewhere around, or the first mate was somewhere around. As we got through on the trip, there were times where we couldn't see the skipper, the first mate, but they were within earshot, uh, which was nice. There was one moment, one night, where I was basically sailing. I couldn't see anybody. I was like in the middle of the ocean sailing this boat. It's like, where did everybody go? Um, I think you two were up at the front uh, doing something, and I couldn't see you in the dark uh, from that perspective. So it was very interesting from that perspective. All right, so I mentioned about the course. Uh, you'll see here a couple of things. One at nighttime, and you may have seen in the news recently with a lot of hits, this bioluminescence, uh, plankton. When plankton is uh, agitated, it gives off uh, uh, luminescence. It's amazing. It was just like this rocket ship. It just seemed like our boat was like a rocket ship in the froth and from the waves. We had the stream of this biofluorescence behind. Uh, uh, we were so busy and we didn't really have cameras, so we don't have much captured. I actually had to grab this from somewhere else, quite frankly, but it looked just like this in terms of the bioluminescence. You see on the left side, there's the group of boats. And on the picture, it looks like everybody's really clumped together, but it's a huge, huge ocean. So in fact, we didn't really see anybody. The little inset, which is where we were, so that's Blue Jay, we really felt like we were alone. Like you don't actually see any other boats around uh, from that perspective. So that was day three. Uh, you start to get a feel for what life is on the boat. You can see where the fruit was hung up down in the galley. Uh, there's a little sitting area on the boat. Uh, Nick, after every watch, uh, whoever was on the one hour helming would go down and enter some of the data in terms of what happened during that one hour, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about. And then we had a fun little uh, two things, actually. One was a contest where we had to guess, and we've now been out in the ocean for three, three and a half days, was a little contest to say, when will we arrive at St. Lucia? So on the left side, uh, Holly, the skipper, put a time in. We all had different guesses along the way. Uh, turns out that other than a little deviation at the end, Holly would have been bang on. So it's not fair that the skipper knew exactly how long this would take. <laughs> Uh, we didn't know that, uh, as it turns out. And the deviation, I'll point out, I have a picture of what the deviation was. It wasn't our shift, we didn't do it. Uh, and then on the other side is the menu. And what was amusing about the menu is that we'd be talking about, oh, tomorrow we'll do this and that, looking at the menu and the food and so forth. And then the morning of, I'll show you what happens, uh, the morning of, there'd be a little note. Uh, there's a picture of it coming up. There'd be a little note saying, please use and it would describe the food that was going to go off soon, and it would toss that recipe out and you know, make something a little bit different. So cooking was always an adventure. A couple of shots of being on the boat, and again with 12 people, was, uh, space was not really exactly at a premium, but you had to kind of manage where you maneuver around. In this, we're talking about getting the spinnaker up. So at a couple of times, and the spinnaker on this particular boat was set to run in the winds, you know, ideally about maybe seven knots up to about 10 knots was kind of good for a spinnaker. So there are a few times we could put it up, putting the pole out, so there's a whole procedure getting the pole up, and a different one whether you're on port or starboard uh, from that perspective. Here's a little video, just to give you a feel for what it looks like looking out. Now, do you see something in there that we often don't do on the Ottawa River? How often have we put lines on to keep the sheep from touching another part of the boat? Like a practically change in course every 20 minutes sometimes in the Ottawa River, it seems. So if you notice there, that was one of the regular things. We're out at sea for 19 days. So I see some nods. Like when you're out and you have regular pressure, it was, it was kind of funny we said at one point, you know, we're going to set the sails a certain way. And we said, well, when will we change the sails? And kind of said, 
maybe like three or four days. <laughs> because as you're just running with the wind behind you, it's mostly a downwind uh, run with the trade winds. So it's really important to make sure lines weren't chafing, that sort of thing uh, becomes very important. So that was the view when you're at the galley looking out over the stove. Uh, so it just kind of gives you a feel for what it's like. That was not a CGI impression. My wife said, oh, that looks like it's kind of animated. So no, that's exactly what it looked like. Day six. So as I mentioned, and you can see the little uh, top right here, you can see that we're getting close to the Cape Verde Islands. This was not the original plan. The original plan is to go across, but because the trade winds are so far south, we ended up going down to this point. And the, uh, the way the Arc Plus, there's another one which goes down to Cape Verde and across. Uh, this is the route that they basically follow. So we're getting ready to come in there. This is Richard at the helm. You can see the Cape Verde Islands. You can get a sense of the speed, the course. You start to get a feel for what it is like managing this boat. Look, it was hard work uh, all the time. Talked about having some physical strength. Everybody had sore shoulders, I would argue, uh, from that perspective. Smiles, so this is good. So uh, we were enjoying smiles despite, so it gives you a little feel for what it's like uh, sailing in. And Cape Verde, there's an air uh, speed velocity accelerator between. So we had to kind of be ready for that. And I'll pick the pace up a little bit just to kind of move along because it is a long way across the ocean after all. At Cape Verde, it was decided because we were going by there anyhow, and there's a head office that's monitoring where these boats are, they said to both of us, so it wouldn't be unequal, like one boat stopping another one getting an advantage or anything, was to go in and just top the fuel up. Way back at the beginning, remember we went around the island, there was no wind at the beginning. Our skipper had the foresight to use the motor to get down into the wind. Uh, most of the boats did that. Uh, we ended up using less motor power, so I'd like to say that we were pretty good about how we managed our boat. Hummingbird had used more of its motor, but we stopped, we got fuel. Uh, we couldn't really get off the boat per se because we'd be going into another country and all that kind of stuff. So this was a really fast stop. This is one of my favorite pictures is Remember we did that contest about when we would get to St. Lucia? We realized we would be at St. Lucia about three days sooner than we thought we would be. And I have successfully in those moments at Cape Verde been able to get on with Wi-Fi through, we figured this out with a few folks, got a, a quick update to my plan, and I was able to book three nights at a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, oh my God, it's gonna be, this just reflects how comfortable it is sleeping on the boat. <laughs> There we are leaving Cape Verde, a uh, night shot. It was red lights at night uh, when we're sailing. Uh, here's Richard was having a bit of fun. They had a photo contest as well. So, you know, the idiot's guide to sailing is what it says on the book there. Um, now, the backside of that actually is about very advanced sailing techniques for doing things like crossing the ocean. And it uh, just gives you a sense of life on the boat passing the time, a couple of folks in the little galley reading a book. That's actually me, finally found a comfortable sleeping position and just like hunkered out to get some sleep for a little while. You'll also notice right up in my head, we talked about those packing boxes. My shoes are at the ready, because sometimes it's like three in the morning. So I could put my shoes on, I could grab my light, I could grab my hat, the uh, vests were on a rail on the side. So you could almost do this in, uh, without any light at all which became really important. So just having everything ready to go uh, as you're coming on and off shift. So that was uh, very important. Day nine, just kind of an interesting little comment on this one. Uh, before we left, we were thinking we should get something for sun protection and we ended up picking up this sheet. I don't know if anyone followed the blogs. We could actually every now and again through a sat phone send a blog up. So there's some blogs and they did talk about something called the Yankee Four. The four sail, there's a Yankee one, two, three are official sails. This was named the Yankee Four and I know the other crew members kind of like, what are you doing with that old sheet? But we rigged it up to block the sun. By day 10, 11, 12, whenever we were going up and the sun came out, the crew was going, where's the Yankee Four? Where's the Yankee Four? <laughs> no, just to get some of the sun protection. So that again becomes really important. But you get a sense of what it's like. It's really fantastic, like just beautiful out sailing and uh, with a great group of people is so important. Here you can see where we're at. So with everything I've talked about and you may be wondering, okay, how long for the rest of this presentation? Look where we are. We're uh, maybe halfway. This is a long way across. And I have to tell you, it, it kind of gets on your spirits a bit like, oh my gosh, day in and day out and cooking and that sort of thing. Um, 
bringing a book, listening to music, um, was really quite useful. So I don't want to say it wasn't a, it's an amazing experience, but by the same token, appreciate that it's a long crossing, a long way to do this. Just a little close up as to what's in the nav book. Again, if anybody has questions about this, we can jump into this in a little more detail. But all the kind of nautical things that you want to track as you're crossing. We did have, we didn't have a lot on the boat, but we did have the, uh, there's one laptop and it had a screen and there was a sat phone lookup. And in the morning, the head office would send us a data file. So we're connected for maybe 10 minutes and the data file would tell us what the wind was. So the skipper, the first mate would get together. They would overlay that on the chart. And by the way, if you can read the little numbers there, you'll see numbers like 4380 and 5300. That is how many meters deep it is. That's in meters. So the ocean is really deep. We went across the trench. You know, you just don't think about it. Like, it, it's just like unfathomable, I guess, is the word that comes to mind. Anyhow, we would get, and they would plot what we affectionately called the blue dots. And with the blue dots, that was our course. And over on the edge here on the far right, you can see Blue Jay. There's a little picture of the ship. And our job then was to helm and follow the course. So that was kind of the drill. Uh, just another video. Again, looks pretty similar to the other one. So there's a lot of commonality. The winds change, the sea changes. Um, you see a couple of things along the way. But that's just the kind of the flow. We had actually pretty nice oceans, by the way. Uh, didn't have any big waves or anything, which was really wonderful in terms of when we crossed. But that just gives you a feel for what it's like on the boat. After the first few days, everyone took uh, seasickness pills at the start. And then after a number of days, some people waned off of them. Some people would just take kind of the, a pill every morning, maybe twice a day or something. Seasickness pills are fine uh, in terms of you don't have to feel bad about it. Everybody takes them. The skipper does. Everybody did that. There's a light dialogue. I'm just kind of doing a scanner on the boat. After guiding the ship is Nick. Richard on standby. So it gives you uh, kind of a sense of what it's like crossing. The waves pick up at different times. Uh, this is kind of fun. So how do you pass the time? <laughs> I tell you, this was like, picked our spirits up. Just sending bubbles across the ocean. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Yes, yeah. I've trimmed the other three minutes of the discussion. It's just like too childish. But we had a great time just watching the bubbles across. Then there was a midway celebration. And just bear with me, it's a little bit, like this is a group of people, we've been on this boat for about, uh, what are we at here, eight, nine days? And we had this celebration, I'll just let you see this. <laughs> so this is kind of the intro to the show. So Captain Mermaid had put together a show for us. <laughs> we had some chocolate cake. <laughs> Welcome to our festival. So that was kind of the opening part. You might wonder what that cucumber is about. I'll cut this, but they had someone with a glass of water spill ash water all over everybody at that point. So a little bit of fun, kind of the halfway crossing. Some other shots at nighttime. So you start to see what it was like. Uh, that one earlier shot, you could kind of see how the sun was setting. Uh, this was the moon. So you, sometimes you get a really bright moon. Uh, the full moon nights were just glorious. This is a view just off the front of the boat as well to get a sense of, so we're 
now getting to the 60% point across the ocean. Uh, pretty easy sailing because it's just with the trade winds, uh, so following with the trail wind as we go. Bit more rocking, so you might kind of wonder. So the seas, as we got closer to St. Lucia, became a little more active uh, from that perspective. So again, that just gives you a feel. And some people would just sit up there for a little while and watch uh, the waves. Again, a um, bit of a view at nighttime. This is the moon shining down. So there's some magical moments in terms of some of the shots that we're able to see. If you look up, you know, just the glorious universe was above. You could see the Milky Way. This kind of captures it, but you can see a bit of that density. So the Milky Way is shown to you, uh, which is just tremendous. Another sunset which was just wonderful. And there's just a shot here. I animated the left side a bit. So as we're getting closer, so we're now at day 12, uh, November 30th, and you can see the boat's beginning to rock a bit more as well. So we're picking up a little bit of motion. That also meant we had to steer the boat. So you got a bit of swerving uh, from those waves, which is why we always had to be working the helm. You can also see the picture there of eating. So we grab some food, sit up top and have a bite. This is Richard finishing his meal. Uh, before he's going to go on watch uh, from that perspective and then trade off. So here we are, just day 13. And on the left side, I was using the Navionics. I think a bunch of us use Navionics. You can see on the left side, we're now starting to measure to St. Lucia as opposed to how far we've come from. And you can get a sense of where we are. That red line across the top, by the way, has always been the ideal line. And you can just see how far south we've gone to get the wind, which actually is the fastest way across, as it turns out. Uh, stay the course, a bit about the swells, uh, basically following the course as we went. So just some shots as to what it looks like. And then day 14 on a watch. And this one was only kind of interesting, is there's a little speck. That's uh, a sailboat. Oh my gosh, we actually saw another sailboat for a little while. And even though on that overall map you could see dots and boats going across, this was one of the few times we saw a boat. And of course in the ocean, was it 23 miles with the curvature of the earth is as far as you could see anything? Uh, anyway, so that was one time we saw a boat uh, in the vicinity. Storms, you might wonder if we had any storms. Yep, we did. Uh, Richard was catching some fresh uh, water. I did the same thing, put my swimsuit on and it was just a bit of rain coming down. You could see on the radar there were storms around and we all wondered if we we're going to get a squall or something like that. As it turns out, we didn't. Uh, there were discussions about, oh, we should have had a squall to experience. I think I was on the cab. Uh, I've been out in the Ottawa River when it's been pretty bad. It's like, I don't think I need to be in a squall. But we did see some rainbows off in the distance, which was kind of cool. So every day was different as we go across. Um, I did mention at one point where we had a little bump. Uh, one of the other teams was sailing. See the blue jay in the middle? You see the course down below and the boat's like going up like this. Uh, after the fact, we kind of had words um, around this. So people had different levels of skill sailing and managing with the wind uh, than others. Uh, just leave it at that. Everyone was great, but it's just something to be aware of. Are we there yet? So day 16, now we're measuring closer to St. Lucia at this point, pretty comfortable. We did have a fishing rod out. We did uh, land one fish. I think we, we had five fish on the hook during the whole trip and we landed one of them, which was very disappointing. I think this little picture of the uh, heading was one of Richard's favorite uh, pictures in a way, because if anyone said, what is it like to sail across the ocean and at nighttime, what does it look like? And we're saying, well, just give a person that, just that red circle. That's what the ocean looks like when you're sailing across. That's all you can see. Couldn't see anything else, and we just had to follow the course. Um, but that's exactly how it looked. There's a little clip here, I'll animate it. You can see how it's uh, cooking on a rolling boat. Like this is hot oven and I got one burn, not too bad. <laughs> See the gloves. There's places to hook in at times as well. So we ate very well, but it was, uh, my gosh, it's uh, a bit of a tricky thing to do that. So now we're getting down to the brass tacks. The seas are getting more energetic. 
Uh, again, kind of sailing in, we're day 18, December 6, people are finding different places on the boat where it's comfortable to lay down, uh, just to rest for a little while. Uh, collage of some different shots at night and so forth. So it's very similar, but it's a bit different. And then we saw this bird, so up in the top corner there, and we knew that when we saw this bird, we were close to land. Woohoo. So at this point, that was pretty exciting. And it was all a case of who's going to spot it. I think our watch was the one where we actually spotted land the first. And then everybody's up on deck. We're all putting our shirts back on again, trying to look nice. You can see the swirl of all the boats. This is a time lapse. So you can see a number of boats have come in already. Uh, we're in the mix of those boats. And then we're the one on the left. Uh, let's see here, where are we? There's another one where it shows where we're coming in. But basically tracking our boat, we're now getting instructions. We can see St. Lucia uh, moving in. And there's a period of time here where, and it's just animated, there's no sound on this particular part, it was too windy. Uh, but basically Holly's going through the drill because we're gonna have to do attack, cross the line. After that, we have to do another sail change real fast so we don't run ashore because it's not a, a big harbor at St. Lucia, that sort of thing. So this was getting, getting instructions, but really, really exciting uh, at this point. So everybody's up and having a look at that. And then a little boat came out. You might wonder, well, where did these pictures come from? So there's a little boat came out and started taking pictures. So the jubilant crew at this point, this is day 19, uh, time to finish. Cranking the sails, getting things into position. At this point, we're kind of a well-oiled machine. Holly is just doing instructions with the harbor master. So we kind of know what we have to do at this stage of the game. And uh, I was just at the back. I was, again, still nursing a bit of an injury, so I was allowed to just kind of do filming at the back at this point, which was nice. Go, 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 Anders. Keep grinding. You know, we heard that often enough. So that's getting the boat ready for the landing. Uh, now people are getting into kind of final position, so we're really close now. Oh, this is the actual finish. See the yellow boy? And then that's the other boat. Do you feel the anticipation? <laughs> Nick is official timekeeper, ready. So we want to get our time right. This is a, a time trip. Sorry about that. I was doing something. So it immediately turned, so I had to go make those maneuvers. So there you go. So that's uh, made the crossing. Okay, are you ready on those head sails? Yeah, are you ready on the head sails? So I have to go make those changes. So these are some of the pictures. There's a little boat that came out and took some pictures of the boat as we came in, which is wonderful to see what the boat actually looked like from the outside. And then we finally pull into dock, and there's that moment of, will we be able to, no, we've got our sea legs. Do we still have land legs? Uh, at this point. So I'm obviously on the dock at this point. So that's kind of the essence of it, um, getting the stuff off the boat. It was an amazing crew. We had a great time, obviously going to have a pina colada or something. Uh, you can see where the boat was in the harbor. We're in our hotel room that we had booked, yay. Uh, so we're now in a very comfortable bed. And then the next day, clean the boat out. Uh, so the, kind of the voyage actually had a few more days to it. And we got the boat cleaned up. They did some little day trips uh, on the sister boat. We did get in ahead of the other boat. Uh, just a collage. The team here is all together. Uh, some had their wives join them as well. And just uh, it was a really wonderful finish. Uh, smiles all around. 
the Ark puts on some great events. So a couple little cruises and things that they took us out on different boats. So you can see a number of the members were all kind of cleaned up. We've had a shower now. Oh, by the way, did I mention that we could do showers every third day? No, I don't think so. Now we could actually shower three times a day if we wanted to. So here's how the two boats, there's a long list of boats down the left side, but basically Blue Jay, when they did the adjustments for time and everything, uh, we came in position five in our category, and Hummingbird was position 16, and we were 19 days, 21 hours, and Hummingbird was 21 days, 20 hours, and to us, that's all that mattered. Uh, <laughs> the rest of the boats, uh, but we did pretty well. I think we were in the top 50 of the boats. It was like 45 or something like that. And the racing boats came in ahead of time. But there we are um, at St. Lucia. So that was the arrival. Um, we ended up flying from St. Lucia down to the south. Uh, you don't need the sound for this necessarily. I'll turn that down a bit. Yeah, turn the sound off. But uh, so at the end of the trip, you know, do some sightseeing, enjoy St. Lucia, that sort of thing. Go by the Pitons. There's a little picture of that at that point, which was very, very cool. So that's kind of the essence of the talk. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here because we want to have time for questions. There is lots of information. Uh, so getting it, this is information from the ARC that one could get online, uh, equipment and training. I really have shown you the 10% of the trip. So much of it is preparation, getting ready, that sort of thing. A lot goes on, uh, which is really quite important. You know, things like getting communications, uh, we use uh, Garmin Enrich, that sort of thing. Uh, making sure you have chargers for your phone. Uh, so there's little tips and hints. The rally handbook is just robust with content. Again, if there's any questions about that, um, you know, the three of us will answer any questions that you might have. It goes into a lot of detail at this point. Uh, between the training days and the rally start, think about that, because there's a couple of days to do sightseeing. Uh, we very ad hoc booked a couple uh, extra days, and we bought some USB fans that we could plug in and have air going around our bunks, which was just brilliant. Oh my gosh, our first mate mentioned that to us, and thank heavens for that. That was a lifesaver. So those are a couple of the items. Um, kind of the highlights of that. So there's other slides here with more technical details and things, but I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much for your attention, and we'll entertain questions. The mic is open for questions. So Mike, I take it Ruth didn't go for the Santa Claus beard? Oh, that, so that's a very funny thing, isn't it? Uh, so we were all, most of us were growing beards on the boat. I did end up, I brought a little portable shave, and at one point it was just bothering me so much. So I have a very odd looking, uh, so my colleagues are telling me, odd looking, keeping this part, but not that part. So if I was going to do the hipster thing, I know better uh, for next time. But yeah, uh, some of us shaved everything off when we got back. Uh, one or two, their families said they actually liked their beards, and I think they still have them on. Yeah. Okay, I got to bend down. Good for catch. This. Uh, just a question: that sailboat that you saw it near the end, uh, was that part of the Arca race, or was that just another cruise or cruising? Do you know? That's a really good question. Um, I think that was just another boat uh, that was out that particular boat, but there were a couple of times where about three times there were our boats that were part of the rally and we did get on to um, the VHF and talk. And it's actually an interesting point because even though you're out in this vast ocean and you can see the tracks and if they're converging, and it kind of surprised me that Holly or the first mate, they got on the VHF and they would contact the other boat and say, what is your intention? To know well ahead of time, if we're going to cross, who's going to go ahead or behind? And there was a time once, uh, remember I showed that one picture where we're kind of going off course? Because of that and going north, we actually ended up encountering some commercial traffic very close to St. Lucia, <laughs> and I was sleeping. And I woke up and I looked at my Navionics and I saw that Bluebird had kind of gone up and done a loop and then was kind of going not quite the right direction. I went, what the heck? has gone on, and it came to be known that we were a bit off course, so arguably this never should have happened if we'd been below, but because of the commercial traffic 
And I did learn that they said to the commercial ship, what is your intention? And the commercial ship said, here's what we're doing and we're not going to change course, even though the sailboat has priority. And uh, our crew decided not to argue. So we had to, <coughs> so they basically kind of did a loop to let the commercial go by and then carry on. Yeah, very interesting. So we did see a few boats, but not many. Who, who, made, who made the decision to do the loop? Uh, I was asleep. Uh, I can't profess to know, did but. You, I, wouldn't it be easier just to like, alter your course so that you could close the CPA and come with your Those are great questions. Was I, it at night time? Uh, yes, it was in the middle of the night. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Great presentation, Mike. Um, just want to know, did you have an auto helm aboard? And if so, was it used at all? So this boat is, and I, I had thought in reading that it might have had like one of those auto wind vane. I knew it didn't have an auto helm electronic setup, but I had thought it would have some steering assist. No, this had nothing. So it was just completely manual helming. And depending on how the wind was and the sail and the swells, we were regularly, and that became an art. Uh, in fact, there was one point, and uh, Maybe I'll cite my wife who, with yoga and meditation and things, one starts to think about you're kind of connected to how the universe works. Pardon me if this gets too weird. But the, the one question came up at one point about when should you be adjusting your steering based on the waves and the helm? And the answer was, before you need to. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's not very helpful. But the idea was to kind of get a bit of an experience for it and watch if you could see where the swells were coming from. But no, it was completely manual. Uh, as it went, yeah, which was, it was, it was, uh, it was work. I don't know, guys, like, it was fun, uh, but yeah, we were on the whole time, so it was quite exciting that way. Yes? Could you maybe get into a bit more detail on how you found the boat? Like, yeah, because, so you were a crew, you on that boat, or how did you find that boat? Yes, so the way that we were researching was, uh, well, we first learned about the ark. So this Atlantic Railway crossing with the trade winds, and I thought, that's fabulous. We're now going with a group of boats. And then the decision was, and maybe I went a bit quickly in that first slide, but we were saying we could go with a private boat, and some of the private boat owners will advertise. So if you're interested, this is actually a good time to be looking. If you go on the internet, look up the ARC 2024 now, and you will find some of the boats are looking for a crew and you pay, and I didn't give the number, it was like 5,000 British pounds, give or take, that five, maybe it's 6,000 pounds now, is more or less what they will charge you to go as crew on a boat, you end up paying for this. And uh, so that was one option. And the private boats had various characteristics. The other end of the spectrum is there's a couple of companies that are commercial companies that do sail training. And to our thinking, we thought, you know what? I think I'll go with the company that does this. They're regularly taking, these boats are in the ocean all year. They've been across the ocean many times, mostly around England uh, with Rubicon. They were not meaning to advertise necessarily, but these are, uh, they're great if you wanted to go. And in fact, if you wanted to get an idea of what it's like, just go to the Rubicon 3 website and you will pick up tons of information from that. And then we just looked at credentials, a uh, 60-foot boat was nice, it was designed uh, based on the weight class, uh, the speed, we looked at how long it took the previous year. Those were the factors that went into it. Is that helping? Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, I think we're good. Well, thank you so much. Um, Go do it. <laughs>